Welcome to the Climate Talk at Berlin Science Week. My name is Julia Wissmann and I'm a journalist and I'm host of the Talking Science podcast of Berlin University Alliance and RBB. And uh, our main issue is planetary health and global health. We always have two scientists from different university departments discussing more or less one topic. For example, virologist um, Christian Drosten is meeting the social anthropologist Jörg Niewöhner of the Humboldt University discussing what climate change has to do with the pandemic situation. We want to show how interdisciplinary research can provide better answers concerning the challenges of our time, especially the climate crisis. And therefore, welcome to the climate talk at the UN Climate Change Conference. At the moment in Glasgow, climate activists express their concerns that the climate talks won't lead to big successes and to big changes. All talk, no action stands on their posters. Time is running out to meet the goals of the 2015 Paris Accord. There's a gap between government pledges and the Paris goals and a credibility problem, I assume. We all know that there is the need for speed on curbing emissions. That brings me to our keynote speaker, Elke Weber. We are all in the same boat and should act like that. The question is, why don't we do it? if we all know that we are facing a crisis. Ecke Weber is professor in energy and the environment, professor of psychology and public affairs at Princeton University. She worked for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, and her main research question is, how can we make wise decisions in difficult situations like the climate crisis. We all are aware of the climate crisis, but change is difficult and connected to loss, and it can be quite painful or at least annoying. But climate change demands behavioral change. What are the challenges? Welcome, Elke Weber. Um, it's great to have you here from Princeton University. Thank you so much, Julia. And let me get my clicker. <laughs> So I will tell a little bit about uh, behavior change, and in particular, understanding the actual psychological processes that lie behind behavior uh, in a time period uh, that has been called the Anthropocene. Uh, to denote the fact that it is human behavior, uh, especially related to energy, energy consumption, the type of energy we use, that is changing our physical environment. We have become the change agents. Then the question is, who is making these decisions? Uh, and the ruling assumption is really one of rational choice uh, coming out of economics. Uh, the notion is that homo economicus you know, makes cost-benefit uh, calculations and decides on the best course of action. Uh, broader theories about human perception, uh, about human comprehension and human decisions are typically only considered ex post, when policies, for example, don't have the expected effect. Um, and uh, it, I want to point out it took until the fifth assessment report, uh, only uh, six years ago, of the IPCC that non-rational -hum, non human decision processes were first introduced into the agenda. So I want to talk about two things. How do all human decision makers differ from Homo economicus, Homo sapiens as opposed to Homo economicus? And I also point out that decision makers differ from each other uh, and that we have to take cultural differences, for example, into consideration when we design our policies uh, and when we implement our policies. I'll talk a little bit about choice architecture, which is a way in which we can design choice environments in such a way that our decisions become wise, become perhaps more rational and take into consideration all the necessary information to help us achieve our long-term goals that we sometimes overlook because of short-term considerations. So, who, who are we? Who is Homo sapiens? And how does Homo sapiens make decisions? It's a crash course, and I want to just talk about these six different uh, items uh, in, in, in short succession, and then afterwards we will discuss them some more. So the first point to take away is that we are subject to finite attention and finite information processes. We don't consider all the information at once. We can't do that. As a result of that, we have to harvest our attention uh, allocated wisely, 
uh, and so therefore we oftentimes uh, focus on what's in front of our noses, uh, myopia, in terms of space, in terms of time, in terms of social environment, and it also relates, uh, results in status quo bias. Uh, let's take a very visual example, you know, the image on the bottom right. You can focus on the white figure and you see a candlestick. You can focus on the black figures and you see two children looking at each other. You certainly can switch, and f switch back and forth between those two percepts, but you really can't see them both at the same time. Uh, what Eric Johnson, who's actually here in the, in the front row, and I said myself have argued in our query theory is that the same applies to decisions. When you're being asked, do you want uh, immediate consumption now, or do you want to sort of wait to get more in the future? Uh, you first argue, think, ask yourself, what's good about one option? What's good about the other option? Uh, turns out that all other things being equal, we generate more arguments for the first choice, the first thing that we consider for a variety of reasons. Uh, of course, that is a recipe for changing people's behavior, for in influencing people's behavior by uh, favoring certain options to be presented first. But what do people do spontaneously? Uh, what do they consider first spontaneously uh, in, in, in such decisions? Turns out the status quo is a very important answer to the million dollar question, what do people consider first? For lots of reasons, right? You've been doing it for a while, you probably had some good reasons to do it in the first place. Uh, you did it for a while, it hasn't killed you yet, it can't be all that risky. Uh, and so we consider the status quo first, uh, which results in status quo bias. I want to show you another example. Attractively labeled options make a difference. Uh, and so uh, a few years ago, I was puzzled by the fact that many Americans buy these uh, offsets you know, that allow you to travel f uh, guilt-free <laughs> to, to different parts of the world. Uh, and at the same time, hate carbon taxes. And the question was, are those different people? Or is it just something about the label that makes us sort of look at the options differently? So. Uh, we asked a, a, a large number of Americans on an online survey, uh, which of those tickets would you rather buy? Uh, the ticket on the left-hand side that includes a carbon fee. For half of the people, the carbon fee was called a carbon tax. For the other half, it was called a, a carbon offset. Or do you want a ticket on the right? Uh, and uh, then there were two pages of text that described why we charged the price we did for, for this carbon fee, uh, what was going to be happening with this money, how it worked, I'd completely identical. The only difference, the word, carbon tax or carbon offset. And so we called the study a dirty word or a dirty world. Uh, afterwards, we asked them about the lots of demographics, but including the political affiliation uh, from de Democrats to independents and Republicans. And as you can see, when the carbon fee was called an offset, it didn't matter. 62% of the people bought the inclusive ticket. But when we changed the word to carbon tax, it didn't matter for the Democrats, but it mattered a lot for the Republicans, who went down to 27%. And turns out that this difference in choices is completely mediated by query theory processes, by Republicans, when they see the word carbon tax, immediately switching to the other option, because it's just viscerally so aversive, they look at the other alternative first. What else do we need to know about Homo sapiens? Uh, we have lots of goals, many goals, uh, too many goals and oftentimes conflicting goals. Uh, we have, of course, you know, self-regarding goals, uh, as Homo economicus does, you know, selfish utility maximization. But we do also have other regarding goals. We care about others, we care about future generations. Uh, we have psychological goals. We want to feel some agency in our decisions. We want to be confident in our decisions. Uh, and so, turns out that only goals that are activated at any given point in time influence the decision, and the other ones are sort of more latently in the background. So that's another entry point for choice architecture. How do we activate relevant goals, goals having to do with legacies, goals having to do with long-term effects of our choices? How do we do that? Um, you also want to evaluate uh, outcomes in a relative fashion. It's always... You know, Outcomes are not considered absolutely, but it's always compared to what? The notion of reference points. Uh, this, of course, uh, one uh, Danny Kahneman and Amos Tversky in 2002, uh, the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences for this theory that basically says, well, it's not absolute, but we have a reference point compared to what? Which, of course, the reference point we can also change for people. That's another entry point for choice architecture. Uh, and why does it make a difference? Because on the gain side, yes, it looks like expected utility theory. We are risk averse. 
Uh, but on the loss side, we actually are risk seeking. And on top of that, you know, the slope of the loss function is much steeper to reflect loss aversion. We, 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 we are more mournful, we more care more about things that we have to lose uh, than we care in a positive way about the same amount to gain. We don't like to lose things. Um, uh, number four on the list, we are committed uh, to our convictions. We are tribal. Uh, convictions oftentimes are part of our social identity uh, and our tribal beliefs uh, influence like a set of glasses what we see. Believing is seeing. Uh, at the same time, uh, we also learn uh, best by trial and error, uh, not by instruction. Uh, getting, learning by getting hurt is a very powerful teacher. We remember those lessons. Uh, and that results in seeing is believing. If we experience negative consequences, now we believe that this action actually is risky. Uh, just to show you a little of evidence on that, we have a, a, a big panel in the field uh, that we started in uh, April of the last year when COVID started, where we've been following 5,000 Americans every three or four months and asked them questions about COVID, their personal experience with it, their beliefs, their worry, their, uh, their actions taken on that, but also climate change. Um, and um, what you see is there's definitely evidence of believing is seeing. So what we have on the left-hand side is climate change, uh, uh, a worry, and on the right-hand side, worry about uh, COVID, uh, and the means uh, and uh, standard errors uh, around uh, people's worry as a function of political uh, ideology, political party affiliation. As you can see, the Democrats are most more worried about all the things by a large, large margin, yeah, uh, than the Republicans in red, the independents somewhere in the middle. Uh, so there's a huge effect of political ideology on worry about climate change on average. Believing is seeing. But on the other hand, we also see evidence for seeing is believing. So any person uh, who doesn't experience uh, negative consequences with either climate change in red uh, or COVID uh, in, in blue uh, doesn't uh, worry about it very much. And you can see the ideological gap. Yeah, the, 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 the two lines are very far apart. Uh, but it turns out when people actually do experience uh, either health or economic negative consequences, either related to COVID because they get sick, you know, they, they lose their jobs, uh, or to climate change related to extreme weather events, uh, the, 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 the lines converge and people's worry goes up regardless and if even more so for Republicans than for Democrats. Uh, and in combination, actually, that personal experiences helps us narrow the uh, partisan gap on the left-hand side to, to the one on the right-hand side. So people who do experience negative consequences uh, do worry more and as a result of that take, take more action. Okay, lastly, we have multiple ways in which we make decisions. So yes, we do make rational decisions or semi-rational decisions. We, we make com com compute costs and benefits, we discount, we consider probabilities, but that's, that's not the only way in which we make decisions. Uh, so it turns out that in addition to calculation-based decisions, uh, we make decisions not with our heads, but with our hearts. And based on based on feelings, on emotions, uh, and oftentimes also based uh, based on rules. We make decisions by the book. There might be standard operating procedures in a company. There might be moral codes of conduct. Uh, oftentimes, those rules are related to your professional identity or personal identity. Doctors, the Hippocratic Oath is saying, regardless of how inconvenient, if somebody requires medical attention, I will provide that because I am a doctor. Uh, and oftentimes, these rules. Uh, based on your social role, are designed to override selfish utility maximization, what home workers would be doing. Uh, and so does it make a difference in environmental decisions? Yes. We have uh, some studies where we looked at uh, utility customers in both uh, the United States uh, and in Switzerland uh, and asked some questions for about a variety, a variety of decisions, but including uh, their willingness to buy uh, green power at an additional price. Uh, there was a lot of information about those two options. But uh, on average, uh, green power is popular uh, in the United States as well, and again, across the, the political spectrum. Uh, so on average, uh, people in both uh, countries uh, were two-thirds inclined to buy a green electricity at that, at that additional price. But it turns out when we asked them afterwards how they made that decision, how, to what extent they made decisions based on calculation, based on emotions, or based on their so social identity and what that identity was, uh, it turns out these are regression coefficients that uh, any decision that was made more based on 
rationality on your head, reduced people's uh, willingness to buy the green electricity, and any degree to which they were making decisions more based on emotions or based on rules and roles increased their willingness to buy, these, uh, to buy green electricity. So what are the implications? Well, when we provide information about these different uh, types of, of, of power, uh, we shouldn't just be doing uh, what we've done in the past, providing people with data uh, to in induce calculation-based decisions, because that will actually reduce their propensity to buy green electricity, but to also provide them with cues uh, that motivate you know, these other decision modes, uh, rule-based decisions, based on their social identity uh, or emotion-based decisions, the warm glow of being part of the solution. So why should we incorporate more realistic models of the human actor? On the one hand, it's a complication. You know, the, the economic model of rational choice is beautiful. It's relatively simple. It provides a single answer about what a certain subsidy will do, what a certain other political intervention will do. Uh, the problem is that oftentimes it's not accurate because we bring more to the table. We have more goals, we have more processes you know, to, to, to uh, make these decisions. Um, and so, in addition to providing more uncertainty, uh, also uh, having a, a broader view of human decision making is an opportunity because it allows us the ability to explain certain behaviors what the economists call anomalies, because they don't coincide with the predictions of rational choice. We can explain them, but perhaps more importantly, it provides us with entry points to design different decision environments, to cue those processes that are more likely to lead to long-term decisions that consider other factors than just the selfish utility maximization. So, of course, the complication is that there's so many theories uh, of human psychology, of human decision making. The question is, which ones are people to use in making those predictions? And in my lab, we've sort of uh, tried to summarize some of these theories in different taxonomies. What are you trying to achieve? Are you trying to achieve uh, getting people's attention in the first place you know, to, to, to the goal you're pursuing? Uh, engage people's desire to contribute to a social, to a public good? Or do you want to facilitate accurate assessments of risks and costs and benefits, uh, help them with their rational decision-making more, uh, or make complex information more accessible, and then the different interventions you know, sort of map onto these goals? Uh, or with a, a, a group of colleagues at the Stockholm Resilience Center, we've been working on uh, uh, you know, just a, a, a framework of what the, the relevant components are in human decision-making, both inside people's heads, but also inside people's social, and, uh, social networks and physical environment. Uh, and uh, then uh, this, which ne that, that network and that, that, that theory allows you to identify relevant theories, you know, to help people with entry points to the more complex world of psychological theories of human decision making, theories about homo uh, sapiens rather than just homo economicus. So with that introduction, thank you so much for your scarce attention. I look forward to our discussion. Julia, back to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I could please um, join me here on the stage for our short discussion. Um, you have the opportunity to ask questions after our or in our discussion. So please um, take your seat here. And um, we are not the only ones who are um, going to discuss this uh, very important topic. Um, please welcome Ottmar Edenhofer, Director and Chief Economist of the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research, Director of the Mercator Research Institute on Global Commons and Climate Change and Professor of the Economics and Climate Change at the Technische University Berlin. Welcome, Ottmar Edenhofer. <laughs> and um, Christian Thomsen, President of the Technical University Berlin, Technische Universität Berlin. Please welcome Christian Thomsen. <laughs> oh, it's difficult to sit on this. Uh, seats with so short legs. <laughs> um, so I, I learned seeing is believing, um, Elke Weber. Uh, so, but why is individual change so difficult, though we know climate crisis won't uh, give us a choice anymore if we don't act now? Well, Change is always difficult uh, for the reasons that I mentioned before, loss aversion. If you think about you know, sort of a bad recipe for change, if you, if you hate giving up what you have, which you have to do if you want to get something else, uh, twice as much as you enjoy giving the new thing, that means that change has to be at least twice as good you know, if, you, if you do it spontaneously. 
Uh, also, change in the environmental domain oftentimes is associated with lots of uncertainties uh, uh, that allow us to discount that. Uh, the consequences, the benefits, you know, sort of come in the future in small dribbles, again, to be discounted. The, 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 what you have to give up comes right now. So I think sort of all of these psychological processes you know, that I talked about, prospect theory, query theory, we focus first on the, on the status quo, all of these sort of cooperate to make this, these decisions really, really, really difficult. Mm -hmm. So, Otmar Edenhofer, what is your um, personal experience with the emotional homo sapiens um, and the many goals uh, that are often conflicted? Yeah, I have every day an experience with homo sapiens, including myself. And I have always a hard time to manage all sorts of emotions. So, uh, um, Even as a rational economist or a homo economist? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so uh, economists are not so, so dumb and fool as you, you might think. So, uh, of course, so we sometimes we, we want to understand the costs and the benefits. But meanwhile, I have to admit that uh, economics uh, has included much more things and, and, and even values and, and rules and norms. And it seems to me that what, what is quite important that uh, from what we can take from these theories, the most important thing is that we create new focal points where we want to be and to inform people and explain people that we are now in a relatively bad equilibrium and we could do better and we could move to another equilibrium. The problem only is Uh, this is very much dependent not on only on us. It's a coordination and a cooperation problem and a, a massive cooperation and coordination problem. And from my point of view, the real interesting thing is that when we talk about cooperation and, and coordination, so people like El Kaweber help us to understand that much better. But I think uh, by and large, and I don't know if you, if you agree with me, social science is, is not really good to understand what helps us most for cooperation and cooperation. I think that uh, even if you take into account this very important aspects El Kaweber has highlighted, emotions, focal point, status quo bias, and all sorts of things, there are a few tools which sounds only appropriate for the uh, boring Uh, 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 homo economicus, which is I didn't say that. No, I said this. Uh, so, uh, for example, the, the coordination power of prizes. I would like to give you an example here. So we did with, with students an experiment and asked them, um, under what conditions would you be able, and observe, not asking them, involving them in a game, and observing under what conditions they are willing to increase their voluntary contribution to abatement. And it turns out when there are a reasonable price setting and people say, when I reduce my emissions, all the others reduce the emission and they can observe this. So they are participating, they are increasing the voluntary contribution to that. So this is just one example where I say, we need, we need a better understanding how to coordinate ourselves. That, that's a huge challenge. And this is not only a challenge for psychology, this is also a challenge for the whole social science because as individuals, We are embedded in complex networks, sometimes in complex markets. It's not only psychology. Sometimes markets are designed in a way where they, they select all the irrational people, right? And sometimes people, uh, markets incentivize people in order to create bubbles. So th th we are, we, the, the thing is that the, the embeddedness of individuals in a quite complex social structure, that's, that's what we have to understand. So our, our understanding is, is insufficient, but I would argue we have enough understanding for the next steps. Okay, but we have to bring it together. Therefore, it's um, interdisciplinary research, very important. Um, that brings me to um, you, Mr. Thompson, um, at the Technische Universität. We, uh, we have the Climate Change Center. Um, you bring together um, climate research from, um, inter from an interdisciplinary um, point of view. Why is it so important to bring all the different disciplines and departments together at a university and even in a a city like Berlin to bring together uh, different players? Well, I think that a city like Berlin is ideally suited for bringing fields together. And I think every field, uh, I would, you would have to name one where it's not possible, every field um, will be able to contribute to climate change in a way, to reduction of climate, mitigation of climate change, um, adaption to climate change in a way that everybody else can learn from it. Um, it's just a matter of thinking about it and then contributing. 
Universities are also a form of, of bubble um, that you mentioned in a different way. Um, it also sort of a bubble and I think a task of a university, a public university, is to um, put forward to the general audience, to the local general audience, to Berlin, to Brandenburg, to Germany, um, issues of climate mitigation. And I think that's what we, our task is as universities to do this and that's why we're putting forward such a climate center like you described. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Edenhofer just um, mentioned uh, um, this topic. I would like to talk about it with you, um, um, Mr. S uh, Weber. Um, there's a debate pitting individual lifestyle change against systemic change, um, as if the two compete. Um, you are one of the authors of a study that finds that both are needed because the public is more likely to support su systemic action if those advocating it have a low carbon footprint, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so what does it mean for our behavior, um, behavioral change in the private sector, for example? So I think Atma made a very important point that we really need coordination across all these different levels of, of action. Yeah? And, and so we have to all pull on the same rope in the, in the, right, in the same direction. Uh, individual behavior, but also uh, the private sector and, and, and the public sector. In part, it's coordination, as, as you mentioned. And in part, it also sort of sets norms. Uh, but yeah, sort of to set a new social norm, you can't just sort of say it. You can't just give lip service to it, like we oftentimes do as individuals or as corporations. That has to be backed up by action. Yeah? And price signals, for example, a, a carbon tax, of course, yeah, they have uh, financial implications and therefore make our behavior different. But they also send a signal that certain kinds of consumptions are no longer okay. You know, they, they create new social norms. Uh, and, and I think so those become that can become tipping points if everything is coordinated in the same direction. Yeah? And, and so therefore action on all these different levels, demand side, supply side, public sector, private sector and, and, and individual citizens can be so much more effective if we can somehow coordinate, which would be one of the functions of this new center. Mm -hmm. The new center we, um, we want to talk also about um, in a minute. Um, so, um, Mr. Edenhofer, um, you mentioned the carbon price. Um, you are a member of the High Level Commission on Carbon Prices. So, can, can you explain it? Because the, um, to us, um, why do we need it and what is the right carbon price? And how can a discussion about the carbon price bring probably all these um, fields together, um, Eike Weber mentioned? First of all, I'm not talking about the carbon tax. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm talking about the carbon price. This is very important. Okay. It, can be, it can be implemented either as a tax, it can be implemented in an emissions trading scheme, it can be even done with a combination of offsets. So that's the first thing. Okay. So I, I would say, wh why do we need this? It's very simple. The first one is, we, we, need a, we need a device which helps us to reduce burning of fossil fuels, coal, oil and gas. And there's a fundamental fact, and the fundamental fact is that given the limiting disposal space of the atmosphere, we have an oversupply of fossil fuels, an oversupply. And despite of, 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 of the large-scale conferences, for example, the one in Glasgow, we have seen this year the highest growth rate of emissions. Emissions are rising, rising, despite of all this awareness raising exercises we have seen over the last two decades. And the reason is that basically we have a carbon price worldwide, but unfortunately this carbon price is negative. We are subsidizing using the fossil fuels around the globe. We have to stop this. I'm, I'm quite convinced. So that's number one. The second one is if you price carbon, if you penalize to a certain extent the use of fossil fuels, you make alternatives competitive. And the third thing is, and this is also quite important, about the status quo bias. And this is something where uh, economists haven't paid too much attention on this. There are always winners and losers. And if you ignore this important fact that there are winners and losers, you can get nowhere. And therefore, the carbon price has the opportunity to raise revenues and you can do this. And we did also an experiment, and this was a quite interesting one. We asked people, 6,000 households in Germany, and asked, what is the acceptable carbon price for you? And then the acceptable carbon price was roughly uh, around, let's say, 10 to 20 euros per ton CO2. Mm -hmm. And then we asked the households, what is your preferred compensation scheme? And interestingly enough, the majority of the households argued the preferred compensation scheme is an equal per capita redistribution of the revenues. And then we ask, 
if this will be implemented, what is then your carbon, the acceptable carbon price? And it turns out the, 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 the carbon price increases significantly. And from other studies, we know that the relationship between the citizens and government is very, very important. People have to trust the government that the government, in the end, will pay back some of the revenues. And if you ask people around Europe, you see different levels of trust between the citizens and government. Trust is very, very important. And if you want to implement such schemes, you have to take into account all these aspects like trust, like social norms. But in the end, we, we need a device which, which helps us to really, to, to, first of all, to reduce emissions. But in the end, it's not good enough just to reduce emissions. We have to bring emissions down to zero by the mid of the century. And we have to leave the majority of fossil fuels underground. This is an unprecedented challenge. And this is an, a policy-induced structural change we are facing, which we have never done in economic and even in social history. So th that's a huge, a huge challenge ahead of us. And uh, you are hopeful that we are going to manage this challenge? Yes, I'm, I'm, uh, if you ask me if the likelihood is very high, I would say no, it's not very high. But if you ask me I'm hopeful, yes, I am. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, uh, Eike Weber, you were nodding, so um, you, you, yeah, you, you think um, it's right. Uh, oh, ab absolutely, I, mean, I couldn't agree more. I think it's far too large a burden to put all the, the, the demands on the demand side and in individuals. We have to have st big structural change in a carbon price that basically prices carbon pollution yeah, and making the polluters pay. It's certainly a very important way of doing it and combining it with you know, the kind of redistribution that you talk about that it appeals to people's social justice and, and, and inequality. People, one of the reasons why people hate taxes, it goes down this black hole and they don't know what happens to it. Exactly. But when it gets returned to people uh, and those who use less carbon actually make money on it, uh, it has worked very well. That's what uh, British Columbia did, the first carbon tax that was imposed in 2008. Uh, it was highly unpopular at the time and within one year it became a very popular initiative. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So um, you just mentioned um, the new um, center, uh, the Einstein Center Climate Change um, that you want to build up uh, and it's um, a public policy and human settlements um, um, institute. So how, how, what do you think? Why is it a good idea to, to have uh, one center f to combine all the disciplines and even mm -hmm. the citizens? Well, <clears throat> one thing that I think is particular about Berlin and Brandenburg is that the two locations are quite different. Berlin is a metropolis, there are four million people living here. Brandenburg is fairly empty, and um, so the questions of mobility, for example, are they're completely differently to be answered. And here in Berlin you can say, take the subway and don't use your car. So that's solved, or take a bike. And um, in Brandenburg, that's not an option. And still, you want to reduce um, carbon emission also in Brandenburg. So but even in Brandenburg, we bike sometimes. <laughs> yes, but, <laughs> but if you want to go to Cottbus, you can't take the bike. You can take a train. That's but okay. you can train. You can take a train. Um, so the solutions are different depending on the environment that you're living in. And I think everybody agrees. It. It's different also in the state. It's different for the continent. It's different for the climate region that you're in, what the solution will mean. Um, but as Otmar said, we'll have to have zero emission in 2050 everywhere. We have to have it in Brandenburg and in Berlin and in the Sahara region, where maybe it's already the case, I don't know. Um, so this multitude of challenges um, presented exemplary, in an exemplary fashion here in Berlin and Brandenburg is what's ideal for the center, apart from the interdisciplinary aspect that we asked, you talked about before. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much so far. Um, are there any questions uh, to our panelists? Uh, we have a microphone here um, and you're free to ask some questions to the experts and uh, about the ECCC. Difficult to, <laughs> to uh, pronounce. Uh, uh, we, um, we hear more about it uh, in a minute from Felix Kreuzig. Um, but if you have any questions, feel free. Ah, there's one. Um, thank you very much. I'm Jana Möller from Freie Universität Berlin. Um, Elke Weber, you mentioned that it was only in 2014 when the IPCC um, started to mention non-rational decision-making, human decision-making, um, as central for climate change and um, the behavior. Are you aware that 
um, this kind of information and knowledge, for example, that your studies show, that you become um, incorporated in these um, reports um, in, in, in a higher level? Or um, so what do you think? Is there, there a development that policymakers, they get more information on this? non-rational By the way, I was responsible exactly. for this. Exactly. <laughs> I was the responsible one because it was the first time when I was co-chair of IPCC exactly. Exactly. inviting people yep. like, like Elke and, and psychologists, social scientists and even philosophers. I had a hard time that my colleagues accept that philosophers can contribute <laughs> something uh, to, to that. So, uh, and and it, I, I fully agree with you. So, uh, all the, the knowledge was, uh, was, was available. Mm. But uh, so uh, IPCC starts as, as a club of natural scientists, right? And, and, and the, the interesting thing was natural scientists always think about a kind of a political voluntarism. Mm -hmm. They say, okay, we know what is the problem. What is the problem? Greenhouse gas. How can we reduce greenhouse gas? Reduce emissions. So people on the street that do not understand this. Therefore, we need psychologists to tell the people how to solve the problem and for them, very often, it's just a problem of political will. And therefore, we decided to, in, to, to include and to invite other social scientists. And at that time, uh, I, I wouldn't argue that we have represented the full scale and the full uh, uh, depth of social science literature, but it is, was the first step in a natural science-dominated environment uh, to come up with a much more sophisticated uh, analysis and, and, and insights. But now the next report is much better. It's brilliant. They, they do a, a wonderful job. People like Felix Kreuziger are responsible for this and now it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's really good. But, but one question, um, how, how can you influence the policy makers? Yeah, but, but so here I would say uh, we influenced already and this is something which people didn't recognize tremendously. So think about the following fact. So the IPCC report has a summary for policymakers. I don't know how much word has a summary. 8,000 8, words. And this word by word... I guess they won't read it. <laughs> that's not true and I tell you why. The whole report is read by all the governments and I tell you why. The summary for policymakers will be approved in one week by all governments. And if a government wants to reject one sentence, this government has to read the report because they can only do this if it is justified by the underlying report. And this is something the IPCC is a unique institution where scientists come together, create a report, write a summary for policymakers, and governments can only change this. Saudi Arabia cannot say we do not like reducing subsidies because we have all at home. They have to say, no, in this report you have a study showing that using uh, fossil fuel subsidies is not so bad as you, th as, as you might think. And then you have a, a scientific debate about okay. this. And that's the interesting thing. And therefore, all the, uh, in, in all governments around the globe, there are experts on climate change reading that report. So in, in that sense, I would say this is a quite a unique achievement. And, and, and in that sense, the IPCC has set the stage. Without the IPCC, there wouldn't be an international agenda on climate change. It is far too, 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 too slow. I agree. The negotiations are far too slow. We need, we need much more appropriate formats in the future. But what climate scientists in the, ta in, the, in the past was a tremendous success. Think about Qatar and Saudi Arabia. Even Saudi Arabia says climate change mm -hmm. is a problem. The impacts are severe and we agree by the mid of the century we need the carbon neutrality. I would say this comes very close, very, very close to a miracle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Can I maybe just add a comment to the question? Yes. Which is, I have to say, I think behavioral science has come a huge distance you know, in, the, in the last five to ten years. I mean, and and you know, economics has contributed to this, behavioral economics yeah, and, and, and related disciplines. But in, on, in, in, on many different levels, and typically lower levels, cities or states, but also some national governments have behavioral insights teams that are no longer just there to sort of implement and communicate you know, sort of uh, political or, or, or financial measures, but also contribute by using the other tools on our table related to social processes. Mm -hmm. So, and if, if I may also add yes, to the of question, course. the Climate Change Center also does not have only natural scientists or only climate scientists. There's, for example, from UDK, Universität der Künste, Ian Hus, there's Frau Becker, who is a philosopher. So, the spread of fields, is it right, a sociologist, philosopher? 
Sociologist, my, my mistake, social, social scientist. scientist. So the, the broadness of the field um, is actually important and you set the stage for that and we continue that on ECCC. Apologize for them. And uh, at ECCC um, you have uh, even not only national scientists, I guess. Um, that's what we have. It's, it's, it's sort of a, a Berlin Brandenburg thing. So we have institutions from Berlin Brandenburg, for example, also the Charité that has not been mentioned, but the um, um, health is an issue of, or climate change is an issue for people. Global health, yes, planetary right. health. That's right, it goes <laughs> together. It's part also of the Science Week this week. Um, there's also the University of Potsdam involved. There's um, other institutions. Um, we're thinking about involving also the United Nations um, Environmental Panel that's in discussion. Um, so yes, it is a nucleus in Berlin-Brandenburg and it's going to extend, hopefully, if we're successful, into an international. And. Um, how do you um, cope with the tremendous knowledge of the, um, yeah, of the citizens? Um, I, I speak about citizen science and uh, um, public knowledge transfer. That's the challenge. That's what you have to do. I mean, the scientists, Otmar and myself, we can talk about the climate change and, and agree probably on, I'm a physicist, so I don't understand the climate really well, but roughly I understand what he would say scientifically. But that doesn't mean that um, citizens outside would even try to follow us. So we have to think about means of being transdisciplinary, of making people listen, public lectures, or going to talk to people, doing projects, citizen science projects, something like why don't you go and count the birds and then f a few years later you see that there are less birds of a particular kind and so that's uh, something that you would want to worry about, about biodiversity in the, in the largest sense. So having projects with scientists is very important on the climate issue and we're doing that. Mm -hmm. Great. Are there many, um, more questions here from the audience? Or are there questions um, from the live stream? I, I don't know. Who can provide it to me? No, no, at the moment not. Okay, no questions. <laughs> okay, uh, one one question from the audience uh, that is uh, at the live stream with us. Okay. So we have to wait a minute. Hello. Yes. How can we engage politicians to give more support to research projects? To, to, I d didn't understand how, it. How do we give, make politicians give more support, support to, to this. climate projects? Mm -hmm. um, we talk to the politicians. There's one here, um, representative of Parliament of Berlin, Frau Chibor. Um, we tell her how important it is to further science and we promise to them that we talk to the people. The people are those that are going to vote for the politicians later, so it's, it's a circle. Um, in that sense, but it's an everlasting issue because always academic institutions have had to ask for money because they're funded by public money in, in Germany mostly. And so there's always a, um, a competition between other needs for spending public money. And so the fight for money for financial resources um, is everlasting. So that's from day one that I became president. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, there's one question. Uh, I understand the, the idea of giving back the fees or taxes, rather not taxes, fees to the people and they, they are happy with that or even more, yeah, they, they like that idea. However, wouldn't you think it is more important to, to get these finances into, say, long-term solutions rather than just giving it back? It's, it's probably a, a question right to me. Um, yeah, f first of all, uh, there's one, I, I missed in my, in my argument one important aspect, and the aspect is the following. There is a, 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 a carbon prices have a, a very negative distributional effect on low income households. Why is this the case? It is the case because the, the share they are spent on, on electricity and on heat is, is relatively higher than of the, the share of the, of the rich households. So economists call this the carbon price has a regressive effect. If you, if you recycle this, well then you turn around or you transform a regressive carbon price in a progressive carbon price, where basically the, the middle income and even in particular the, the high income households pay the bill. And, and I believe, so to be honest, in the next 10 years, we will see carbon prices or abatement costs above 100 euros per ton CO2. And even if politicians might decide 
They will not use the carbon price. This will be the costs. It, it costs a lot to achieve carbon neutrality. So there is no doubt about this. And then the, in the end, the question is who, 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 should, who should bear the costs? And it would be, from my point of view, unacceptable if we would uh, impose such a burden on, on, on the poor households. This would, uh, we would reduce the socialist acceptability of, of climate policy. I don't believe that climate policy uh, can substitute social policy or distributional policies, but at least you have to design climate policies in a way which does not widening the gap uh, between the poor and, and, and the rich people. So that's number one. And therefore, to a certain extent, we need recycling schemes. I'm, I'm absolutely uh, convinced about this. Of course, we need investments also in long-term solutions, in long-term technologies. And not everything can be financed via the revenues of the carbon price. There are other components in the budget of a, of a, company, of a, of a country, uh, in, the, in the fiscal budget, where you can basically use this, uh, these expenditures to long-term investments, to uh, launch uh, future technologies like synthetic fuels, like hydrogen, like negative emissions. That's, that's quite important. But this can only be done if you do a reprioritization of the, of the, of, of, of the budget. So in that sense, so this would be my, my answer to your, to your request. So in, in the end, to make a very long story short, we have to do both. So oh, thank you very much so far. Um, are, are there more questions here from the audience? Thank you for your questions. Thank you for your answers and the uh, short discussion. We want to go deep into the ECCC now um, and to learn about more about the idea. So thank you very much, um, Mr. Thompson, Mr. Edenhofer and Mrs. Um, Weber. Please, thank you. little applause. So, Felix Kreuzig is head of Working Group Land Use, Infrastructure and Transport at the Mercator Research Institute on Global Commons and Climate Change and professor at Technische Universität Berlin. He presents the idea of the Einstein Center Climate Change and Public Policy of Human Settlements now. Welcome, Felix Kreuzig. Thank you. <coughs> so... This is a new and planned Einstein Center, and I'm very happy and excited to be able to, for the first time, to present the idea in public. It's on public policy and with a focus on human settlements, that means cities. So why? Why actually this focus? Why does it make a difference? Um, and I would like to answer these questions in the next minutes. <clears throat> Starting also from an institutional point, which we have heard already, the institutions involved, it's involving both Berlin institutions, Tech University, UDK, Universität der Künste, Charité, and Brandenburg institutions, University Potsdam, and <coughs> the Potsdam uh, Institute. And it involves Berlin and Brandenburg because the idea of human settlements can't be answered alone within one set of administrative boundaries. <coughs> Professor Thompson was um, alluding already to the fact that, of course, there are differences in the different spatial settings, but even more, Berlin and Brandenburg are connected. They're not independent of each other. When housing policies influence the choice of people to move outside of Berlin to Brandenburg, first because it's cheaper, it has an influence on the emissions in the housing because it's different housing structures. And inversely, this decision also influences transportation emissions because new mobility patterns emerge. And from that perspective, already one direction becomes clear. We need coordination between, across the administrative boundaries, and that's why the focus Berlin and Brandenburg is there. There's an, another <coughs> institutional background. This is envisaged to become part of a global network of public policy institutions. We have um, <coughs> coordinating with, uh, with institutions. Uh, Princeton, Berkeley, Daly, and others are involved, and uh, LK Weber, for example, um, is also part of that. Um, <coughs> and the interesting thing is that none of these public policy institutions actually is focusing specifically on cities and human settlements, so we are closing a gap here. And while the focus is where we want to find answers is, first of all, on Berlin and Brandenburg, very specifically, the vision, and the vision is nonetheless to have global impact also with the tools that we are developing. <coughs> the why question is still not easy, because if you go into 
the solution pathways that investigated how to achieve climate neutrality 2040 or 2050, you first of all see clear-cut pathways that are technology dominated and appear not to necessarily <coughs> require involvement of cities. For example, the Ariadne project headed by Gunnar Luderal and <coughs> Maidenhofer from PIC found pathways in sectors of how to achieve climate neutrality. From a city perspective, the emissions in cities where cities have influence on are housing and transport. These are the two direct most, first of, uh, <coughs> most important sectors to go for. And in the mission pathway CC, you need to electrify the sectors. You need electric transport, electric individual transport. You need heating sector electrified by heat pumps and by district heating, electric uh, electrified. <coughs> and you need investments into housing. Um, and the pathways appear to be clear, so what, what's really uh, needed here? The first of all, you don't just say this is happening, you need really some an alignment of all actors. I call it the great institutional alignment, <laughs> because sometimes you need, or mostly, you need a number of institutions involved, and sometimes it's enough if one institution puts a break on it. And cities obviously are important, but not only cities, but also actors in cities, like urban planners, transport engineers, and so on. So you need this alignment and you need to take everyone on board. So that's uh, <coughs> one direction, it's, it's uh, saying the how. Um, <coughs> it requires to address non-monetary markets. Okay, Weber was alluding to it, um, the uh, architectures of how decisions are made. Um, and if you take, for example, um, housing, the analysis has showed that deep retrofits, like making housing more energy efficient, is <coughs> um, a rational economic choice by now. You save money over the long run. But there are problems with that. The first problem is <coughs> um, the renter profits from it, but the owner has to do the investment. There's a misalignment of incentives. There's another problem with this, uh, with the, which is related to discounting, right? The, the gains accrue in the future, but perhaps just now you don't even have the liquidity, right? So the, these kind of things are happening, and these are not, I mean, it's a tie two major examples, but you actually have a number of those, like really like 10, 20 of these things going on in housing markets, but also uh, when you make decisions on electric mobility, and many of these are related <coughs> to city-specific regulation. So that's something to go into, um, and it m uh, may be important to just create new markets and to also create markets that are not only interested in the monetary dimension because it, the information and money, uh, value of money in markets is now actually supplemented by the informational value given by big data and there are possibilities to create these new markets for that. <coughs> but there's an addition, it's not only the how, the how is very important, that's what we have to do, but it's also to enlarge the solution space. Enlarging solution space means infrastructures because and again, it relates to something that Elke Weber is saying, like, <coughs> we are guided by specific, like, what, what, what appears first to us. What's the obvious thing to do? And if we look at the street and choose how to use a certain transportation mode, like, it makes a difference whether it's a public transit station in front of the door, whether it's a bicycle lane, or perhaps <coughs> in future, whether we have collect a shared pooled mobility also for the suburbs and not only for the, for the inner city. That makes a difference and to provide the infrastructures enables to get actually to these new solutions and it's cities that can do that because cities <coughs> um, regulate the spaces and places, the things that you can really touch. <coughs> okay. That's the main motivation. I just want to um, give a few examples, like the uh, uh, structure of what, how we're doing it. We go through governance pathways and tools. So the, um, these are three different dimensions. They relate to like, different modes of investigation, like actually who is doing things and how are people acting, what are the specific options, um, and also like, what kind of specific tools can be used to, for example, accelerate mitigation. <coughs> um, the, um, one, one example I would like to give, uh, two examples, one is on mobility, 
Um, the idea is to actually interact between these different levels, to have narrative tools to explore them in stakeholder engagement, to feed them into models, so to feed ideas from stakeholder engagement into models, <coughs> to perform a governance analysis, what it means um, to integrate this with AI-based urban planning, so to have a complete loop of research <coughs> bridging the technical engineering gap with the social science expertise. Same is true for buildings, um, <coughs> where we have very high data-based insights, but we also work with surveys and perform governance analysis. And this relates to an important finding that will be emphasized also in the coming IPCC report. We have not only the high-level policymakers, and then we have the more or less passive or perhaps active consumers but we have all kind of other actors, like investors, for example, we act as role models, and here specifically we are interested in professionals, like in the intermediate level, into building engineers, transport engineers, transport planners, urban planners, and <coughs> to, to, to work with them on design that works is a key dimension to go forward. Okay, um, we integrate this by having a public policy unit, and public policy really relates here um, of course, with political science, but it integrates a number of disciplines that make insights useful for public policy. <coughs> and um, it integrates also by having the engagement with all relevant actors from policymakers, which are of course important, but um, with industrial roundtables and citizen engagement to different <coughs> parts of society. <coughs> we will also do interfacing and transfer. We will um, hear perhaps in a discussion from Timothy a little bit more on that. Um, the idea that we really simulate um, <coughs> um, solutions um, and then uh, have stakeholder consultation, but also really a focus on narrative interfacing to see like what kind of narratives are working and what make a difference. Perhaps, for example, integrated with the ideas that uh, Ekeweva has found in her research. <coughs> so this is uh, my last slide, and I would like to emphasize what is actually really new here. Um, so the first and obvious thing is it will be the first public policy center with focus on subnational governance. Um, it will virtually integrate the different scientific approaches related to governance studies, more technical pathway analysis, and tools also big data and AI tools that are new to the opportunity space. And <clears throat> finally, um, it uh, will treat individuals as heterogeneous agents, so to take up all the complexity that's actually happening in, in real housing markets, uh, transportation, mobility decisions, and so on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please stay here because you have the opportunity to meet the scientists of the ECCC now. Um, Felix Kreuzig, um, yeah, you can take your seat. You're probably yeah, on the on the right side. And um, please welcome uh, another scientist, Dr. Sophia Becker, Professor of Sustainable Mobility and Transdisciplinary Research Methods and leader of the Interdisciplinary Junior Research Group Experi at the Technische Universität Berlin and uh, the, um, the Institute of Advanced Sustainability Studies, IASS in Potsdam. So welcome. Thank you. Sophia Becker. And um, Timothy Ingen Hus, Professor for Dramaturgy and Design of Audiovisual Communication in the Department Communication in Social and Economic Context at Berlin University of the Arts. Um, you developed a nonlinear visual language, I learned, um, the elephant's memories. Um, what, uh, for example, is the idea of this language and how could it help to, for example, um, bring this complex um, climate research uh, themes uh, to the public? Uh, you're throwing me in the cold water oh, here with this uh, really? question. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Okay. Uh, no, no, that's, that's perfect. Be, be uh, spontaneous. You know, it's, I think it's about norms, basically, really. It's, okay. um, it's about uh, language is something we all use, so we are, we are immersed in this uh, system of representation. And uh, city is also a system of representation. And I suppose that uh, what's uh, interesting in the presentation that Felix just made and what Sophia Becker is doing and what 
Elke and, and Erik uh, are developing uh, all together is uh, an, a reflection on, on norms, on, 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 on the invisible laws that govern the way we act and, 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 and behave. And if we can uh, engage with these laws in a creative and, and critical way, both, um, both in an interesting interaction, then we can find new ways to, to construct an environment that is uh, less uh, damaging for, um, for, for us. So um, it's basically by becoming aware of that and, uh, and trying to, uh, to be productive and create, uh, creative and critical about it. Okay, so <laughs> very good, uh, spontaneous answer. Um, so, uh, Felix Kreuzig, uh, why is it important to have um, new, um, you, you said you have to enlarge solution space, and I guess this is one example to enlarge solution space. Why is it so important to have um, new perspectives, for example, of, a, of an artist, of a designer? Uh, there, there are two levels of answer to that. Let, yes? let me first answer on the technical level. Um, and that, uh, I mean, like, we have two decades in front of us that are really important, and that's the time that we're having. So basically, we need to draw on all available solutions if we want to have a chance to that. And that means, like, in, in addition to the technologies, we need, like, for example, um, uh, infrastructure choices and, like, new, new lifestyle models. And um, just to be very specific here, most of the solution will come from carbon-free energy, renewable energy that goes into the different sectors, but we can't scale up fast enough. We don't manage to get all of that off the ground in the next 10 years. We need it for transportation, for the electricity sector, for, for heating. We may need it for even for negative emission technology. We need renewable energy for everything, and we can't scale it up enough. So we need now solutions that actually save energy. Like every bit of uh, megajoule that we are saving now on energy will be beneficial, especially now, less relevant in 30 years. That's, that's, that's one way to think about it. And <clears throat> the, the narratives and the artist perspective is so important because of the alignment of all, all actors. Like we uh, need not, perhaps not necessarily the same board, but we need to have a common direction. And that does not work about a technical argument, it works about stories that involves about getting people's attention um, uh, to, to, to the visceral level. So again, like relating to where we pick people up, how do we go together into the same direction. Mm -hmm. So Sophia Becker, um, your main interest is um, um, mobility. Um, so uh, what, what is your narrative? What, is, uh, what can you say? How can we achieve um, um, climate friendly mobility in a city like Berlin, for example? Mm. Well, I think Berlin, um, in Berlin, we are in a very good situation already because um, we have... Mobilitätsgesetz. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so you can answer the question as well, I think. <laughs> um, because uh, I was just uh, wondering about the uh, English name. I think it's Mobility, mobility Act. Mobility Act? Yeah, yeah I, it's I, Mobility not Act. Not law, yeah. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, the Mobility Act um, has also, as you just said, two dimensions. Um, one is a technical or a, let's say more a planning dimension on um, a lot of measures that will change the city towards um, a bike friendly city, a city that is good for pedestrians and for public transit. And yes, that means we have to reduce car use and we have to reduce car ownership. But then um, the second dimension and I would say beneficial dimension of the Mobility Act is that it also has um, an attractive and positive vision of how we want to live together in the city in the future. And we have seen with the pop-up bike lanes here in Berlin, um, which have drawn a lot of attention also from the international audience, um, that having a future vision like climate neutrality or um, accessible mobility for everybody makes us resilient um, and able to act and to respond to crises, even such as the COVID-19 pandemic. So I think in Berlin, um, we already have a very good starting point, but I also have to mention who, whom we have to thank for that. It's actually not science, and I would even say it's not policy policymakers in the first place, it's civil society because we had the Volksentscheid Fahrrad, the cycling referendum, and they have pushed that forward. They have created new narratives. Um, and then the policymakers have followed that, um, thankfully, and in a very good way. Um, but I think that also shows that collective action for change, um, sometimes from the bottom up, can be much more powerful even than our um, scientific models. Very powerful, but also very controversial because um, there were a lot of fight in Berlin about uh, this mobility um, act, um, but uh, it's worth it. 
you would say. <laughs> yes, and I think that's another... It's not, um, not, not final now. No, I think the fight is a very important point that you were talking about, because that's also something, I think, where we as scientists, as um, social scientists or interdisciplinary scientists, such as in the Einstein Center right now, um, we really have an important role. Um, it's not only that we give recommendations about what policymakers should do if they were reasonable, um, it's also evaluate developments that are already ongoing, such as the Mobility Act. Um, and now uh, the Mobility Act had its third anniversary this year, and um, in front of the upcoming elections there were heated and controversial debates. Is, is it a good thing, or if it's actually quite stupid and dumb because uh, it's not implemented, or it's not implemented fast enough? Um, and I did an al analysis together with a planning expert from the TU Berlin, and we really got, got, went in depth and had a look and checked everything that had been done and had not been done. And our evaluation was quite positive, actually, because giving the task, changing 50, 60 years of car-friendly infrastructure, we cannot expect that this can be achieved in three years. It's just not realistic. And so I think sometimes as scientists, we, are, we have the responsibility not only to criticize, that's important too, but also sometimes to give positive feedback in a way for the slow positive changes and the good changes that are already ongoing. For example, the pop-up bike lanes <laughs> that are also very controversial, but uh, we have them back. <laughs> yes, for example, and that's also because of the Mobility Act. Yes. Because the Mobility Act um, has this fixed vision and the um, pop-up bike, lane, bike lanes were an accelerated um, version and that's where policymakers, together with civil society as well, used this window of opportunity that came up during the crisis. And I think also, I mean, before um, Ottmar Edenhofer talked about hope, <laughs> and I think the, um, the pop-up bike lanes were also a positive example that a crisis or that change in general is not only something difficult and negative, but it can also accelerate um, positive developments, actually. Okay. Um, I would li like to add something yes. here, and coming out of that is an important observation, because mm -hmm. why did this change happen? What, what, what was the motivation? Climate change was one of the motivations, but not the only one. For cyclists, safety is super important. But then, like, one result also is life quality of life. Like, spaces become much more livable and nice to be there. And if you actually monetize this, or would monetize it, these benefits are higher than the climate change mitigation benefits. And the interesting thing is, when you're in cities, you are basically always in this multi-goal function. You don't have only one goal. You have several at the same time. Sometimes it makes it more difficult. Sometimes it makes it easier. But because you're always on the specific places and uh, spaces, you have to act in an environment that modifies different goals. And that makes it so interesting also to work here on that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Going back to you, um, um, Mr. Ingen Huth. Um, so, I learned you work with storytelling to figure out what to tell to whom, why, when, and how. And so, uh, where do you see your, um, your part in this ECCC, for example? How can we use narrative processes to investigate and uh, probably transform situations? Well, you said the word, the T word, transformation. That's like it's a, it's, it's a, it's a word that you hear everywhere at the moment, and it's, it's, uh, it's Is it a good word, or is it uh, a, it's, it's a buzzword a because it's uh, nobody can really uh, has a, a, a picture? It's of an attractive word because it makes you feel like something new is going to come, but it's, it hides something else. So uh, the word is conflict, I guess. It's uh, and, and we, we can't uh, we can't ignore that uh, anything that uh, looks and feels like uh, transformative change is a word that you read also in uh, IPBS report and it's 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 attractive but it's uh, as i said it's it's um it's covering up a, a number of uh, of uh, very painful difficulties that we are uh, we can't afford to to look in the eyes so it's we talk about solutions we uh, we should talk about uh, about more problems as well because there will not be a solution that will not cause more problems so there is uh, there is a certain um need for um um, mapping the diversity of positions that are uh, uh, that are to be taken into account, and this is where uh, this uh, so-called citizen engagement processes are um, are, are being uh, conceived, or so like workshops and situations in which you trying to record, scan, and uh, interweave the different points of views of different societal actors, which are. Uh, embedded in a, in, a, in a city or in a regional environment, so that you understand their, their reality, because they know their reality better than anyone else. 
So when we talk about uh, citizen science, this is also the type of science we want to talk about. This is the science of your own existence. And it is, uh, it is important to um, not fool ourselves on the kind of participation that we can create so that we're not uh, trying to make pe people believe that everything they say will be listened to and will be taken into account. Uh, that, is, uh, that is part of the, of the multiple problems we have when we, we think of, uh, of, uh, of a participatory um, uh, policy-making processes, is that we, we have to be realistic as to, as to what is possible to be, to be done, but also we have to listen to, uh, to as much as possible and also uh, interweave these things. So new ways to do it are perhaps necessary, and also simply because uh, the way we do it, not just the fact we do it, but the way we do it is important. So that's where designers and, uh, and artists and architects and, uh, and, um, and uh, dramaturgists also uh, are, are welcome because they, they engage you creatively into situations that you can uh, picture, that you can pre-act, pre-enact as they call it, as to be able to better perceive their consequences. So uh, the UDK is the consequences and probably the benefits. The, the, yeah, the consequences, <laughs> benefits, the collaterals, certainly new, uh, new gaps which are opening, new uh, spaces which become free in a city where you could intervene and create new things. So that there's uh, there's lots of opportunities and and and, uh, and that are showing up that you couldn't imagine if you wouldn't listen to people. Mm -hmm. And that's why uh, that's why it's important to think of the best way to do it. And uh, I suppose that the UDK is in a, in a good position to do it in an attractive manner. So this is why we're there. Okay, and uh, what is it like to uh, to work in an interdisciplinary team, for example, at a, a center like ECCC? Um, how do you find the same or one language, <laughs> probably? Oh, where are the challenges? Will you be nasty about it? Yes. Well, you don't find the same language. That's why you <laughs> two talk together. This is uh, this is uh, no. He's laughing, uh, Felix. Um, this is uh, it's it's it's, it's the research process that is supposed to be developed is reflecting the problems we have in the world. We don't listen to each other. I think this um, um, Donatella um, Donella Meadows, I believe, which is like the, um, the one who invented this uh, leverage point transformation um, uh, uh, perspective on systems was saying that um, the greatest uh, scarcity is, uh, is attention, um, something that uh, Elke Weber and Eric Johnson know very well, and it's listening to each other is, the, um, is what we, li we must be doing. So um, I suppose that this is true in society, this is true in, in reality, this is true in research environments, so we have to listen to each other. Listening and asking questions, because I can't understand everything, so I have, I have to um, be able to, to ask questions. I guess. That's your job. Yes, it's, it's my, not only my job, it's yeah. uh, the job of, of everybody of us. Of course. So, yeah. Is there back? Let, just to add to this, um, I think in general, yes, of course, interdisciplinary cooperation is quite difficult. Um, but here in the Einstein Center, um, we have a special um, benefit and opportunity, I think, and that's Berlin and Brandenburg. Uh, so that's what we call a boundary object. So we have one city and or region and one federal state and a city state. And then we bring all these different researchers from all over the world, uh, even from the USA, together um, to focus on a common obje object and to bring in their different perspectives. But we are all looking at the same focal point, and that makes it possible <laughs> to understand each other. I mean, it's, I think it's a long way to go, of course, and we don't have a lot of time, so we're trying to accelerate everything. Um, but I think that's the very important prerequisite, um, especially in mobility, where every city has its specificities. And even we go beyond uh, interdisciplinarity we, because we want to be a transdisciplinary center. Um, and that also means to build cooperation and coordination um, with policymakers. So um, the development of the Einstein Center will be a two-step process. First, there is a first phase of two years that will um, hopefully start in January. And we will start to talk with policymakers in January and February um, in Berlin and Brandenburg to include their views, their perspectives, their concerns, their hopes um, in the full proposal then um, so that we can produce something together that is really beneficial for society. And I think that's also what really f what fits very well um, to the slogan of the TU Berlin, um, that we have the ideas for the future for the benefit of society. And I think with the Einstein Center, we go even one step further to develop those those good ideas together with society uh, for the benefit of the society. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. So far, um, are there any questions from the audience? Um, meet the scientists of ECC. See. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> That's difficult. Yeah. Well, you well, thank think you. About it. <laughs> you have a, I think, quite short list of disciplines on your, your slide. Uh, oh, I think um, he is calling. I, I don't know if it's... Uh, <laughs> How do you mean it? If it's exclusive, for example, no psychology on it, no sociology on it, no educational uh, science on it, is it all included in the notion of transdisciplinarity or how is it that you focus uh, on political science, uh, economy and the other uh, disciplines you mentioned, but, but political science is the only social science you mentioned. Maybe there is a specific background for it or is it just uh, in the process of development that other scientists can, can also contribute? Mm. Um, well, I think we, we have psychologists, uh, such as me, for example, <laughs> um, but, uh, but, uh, yeah, but having a background in sociology as well, but of course, I mean, I cannot do all the work. Um, and it, yeah, that's true that sociology um, is not explicitly on the list yet, but I do think that especially in mobility and housing, um, there will be sociological perspectives um, as well. And um, Elke Weber, for example, talked about social identity processes. Um, and we've, we have talked, or maybe we should talk, about the identity of a city. Um, and that's definitely where um, we all acknowledge that it's not only about psychological um, and individual processes, especially coordination of actors is also um, a, a sociological question or yeah, in between political analysis. But we also have philosophers, actually. Um, we have a lot of people like Felix and me, I think, where it is actually quite difficult to uh, say that we only represent one discipline. Mm. Um, I don't know, but uh, your stations, you know them better, but I actually cannot say what the discipline is that you represent. Me neither. Okay. <laughs> uh, so I think we're already in a process where we go a little bit beyond classical disciplinary boundaries, or how would you see it? I, I actually see it like that because the main uh, questions, I mean, like, you simply can't answer them with a disciplinary focus alone. It's like if you question focused, you immediately go across boundaries. And I think that's the, the spirit of the ECCC. So obviously, we sometimes, we perhaps, we are limited currently in. Um, who we are, and sometimes we need expertise outside what we can really have currently. Um, but um, I think the spirit already is going into the right direction. And um, I try to imagine, how do you work? Are there, is there a working group and you invite um, different scientists um, to solve one question? Or uh, do you brainstorm to, to, to get the question? Or what, what's, what's the idea? Probably you. Uh, I guess that the, the finding the problems is the first thing. So, and, and, and as, 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 as we are also a problem, because we're all in our, in our own disciplinary perspectives, and as Felix just said, we come, we come across these, these disciplinary problems by, uh, by engaging with uh, specific questions and problems that we have to identify and contour. So there's a lot of it has to deal with, uh, with communication. I'm very uh, thankful for the opportunities to, sp to speak with uh, such, um, such interesting minds as, as yours. And I think that it's always uh, very uh, wonderful when we can, when we can uh, realize that the conversation is richer than any one of the, of the, of the, um, uh, the, the speakers. So uh, yes, these are workshops, and we, we hope there'll be more of them. We all have to make time for this because we all have other commitments. But this is an, an, a priority, and I guess this is uh, up to MC Kreuzig okay. to make sure well, that this so is happening. It's, it's on top on your commitments. It's on the top of all the commitments. Uh, <laughs> all of As them, usual, of course. <laughs> sure. And, and you just do it for Felix Kreuzig? No, I do it for the world. Okay, great. I just, <laughs> Who else? I was wondering. No, I'm disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I think you I, must be really convincing. I, 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 th I think we need uh, two talents. The first one goes back to Greek philosophy is know what you don't know. Yeah. So that you feel you need a clear eye what you don't know, and then you need to know who to ask. So okay. that's, that's, the, that's the starting point to answer everything that we don't have an idea about. Yeah, but then as, as uh, Herr Edenhofer uh, said earlier, he, he managed to invite a philosopher in the, uh, in the uh, IPCC. And philosophy, as you well know, uh, mm -hmm. Sophia, it means like the love of wisdom. So there's like data here, information is there, then there's what's knowledge a little bit higher and wisdom is on the top of it all. So, so what do you do with all this stuff that's below it? That's uh, what we're supposed to find out. So we're a wisdom and specialist. Wisdom yeah. specialist. Um, and uh, <laughs> what, what is it? 
Yeah. <laughs> it's a, it's a, a, a holistic approach in itself. Mm. Mm. Okay. <laughs> okay. So we contract <laughs> we're contradiction specialists. Contra contra contradiction specialists. <laughs> Um, as a um, citizen in, um, here in Berlin, Brandenburg region, how can I um, participate, for example, at the ECCC? Um, is there an opportunity? For, um, what, what, what do you think? How, how can you um, interconnect with citizens and probably also NGOs like Changing City or something like that? Um, so we don't have the, the workflow yet specified. Um, but um, there will be obvious formats. So we will act on the different levels, and that means, for example, also go on, going down to street level to really see what's happening at a specific street corner. And that can't be done without like, talking to everyone. So like, that's a starting point, like the specific formats. And then there will be other formats, like where we invite people uh, in workshops. So this is a general outline, mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, we need to specify this workflow. Um, but uh, yeah. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. So far, um, are there more questions here from the audience? Or even from, ah, in the back there? I'm a landscape planner uh, at TU Berlin, uh, retired, but I'm interested in one uh, issue which was not mentioned here. It is nutrition, agriculture, and this agriculture, is part of the reporting of the uh, IPCC uh, in the chapter Land Use, Land Use Change and Forestry. And agriculture is one of the main sources of uh, uh, carbon dioxide and uh, uh, climate gases. And for example, organic soils uh, emit every uh, hectare and year, 30 tons of uh, CO2. And the city of Potsdam, which has a lot of organic soils, has uh, from agriculture and from this organic soils, uh, as much, uh, about as much uh, emissions uh, of climate gases as from traffic or from buildings. It's a very important issue. And it, this is true for Brandenburg uh, in any case. And uh, I would be uh, interested to know how you uh, integrate this. You uh, told, uh, told about transdisciplinary uh, approach, and I think this uh, nutrition uh, must be part of this uh, solution if you uh, look not only to the city of Berlin, but also to uh, Brandenburg. We are engaged in the moment to uh, prepare a climate plan for Brandenburg. I'm part of the team there, and uh, that is why I mention this, because I think it's an important issue. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. So first, let's get in touch. Um, and second, um, there are three answers to your question. Uh, the first one is, uh, it's, a, it's a small center to start with, so we need to focus, and we focus on the two issues to s that have the highest emissions in cities, which is transportation, mobility, and the building sector. Um, however, we will go in a hopefully second period also to issues like agriculture, land use, uh, and energy systems. But that's, we can't start with that simply because of resources. And, and there's an, an, another point of view to that, and it's like uh, Elke and Maya, uh, we, are, we are writing the demand side chapter for the IPCC. And the interesting point is like in the, from a food perspective, food is demand of agriculture to, to a large degree, not only, but large degree. From a <coughs> the food perspective has the largest demand side mitigation potential, which is mostly in dietary shift. And dietary shift can be starting in cities. And that can again happen by choice architectures. So like uh, just having cafeterias as a default option, the vegan or the vegetarian option. That makes a lot of difference in terms of supply side, uh, like inducing and changing supply side emissions. And here is the cities coming back again. Mm -hmm. Are there more questions? Um, I wonder, because uh, yeah, the Climate Change Center, how, how do you work together um, in future? at the ECCC <laughs> and the Climate Change Center? So that's the real question that we cannot answer. <laughs> no, that, uh, so the, the Climate Change Center is already there, and we will be working side by side. So the Climate Change Center is uh, um, 
uh, realizing the larger institutional context to bring in additional institutional and academic players in and also seeking additional funding from other sources. And um, the content-based agenda will be focused within the ECCC. So that's the way forward, but will be closely entangled. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, it's an answer. <laughs> So, are there more questions from um, also from the from the live stream? Is there any question or not? No, no. <laughs> okay, thank you.